Thank you very much. I hereby call the 47th Biennial Convention of the National Association of Letter Carriers to order. Color guards pose colors. The National Association of Letter Carriers assembles biannually for the purpose of declaring specific mandates and objectives which hopefully can be accomplished in the next two years. More than 3,200 delegates registered for the 47th Biennial Convention of the National Association of Letter Carriers. As delegates received copies of the many committee reports and other important matters to come before the convention, the serious business about to be undertaken was already evident. We are not going to dwell on history at this convention. We're going to explore the future. I want to discuss with you today our prospects for the years to come. Years which will be just as exciting and as important as the past two years have been, but I hope not quite as turbulent. Let's not talk so much about where we've been. Let's talk instead of where we're going. Last March, the power of the Union was unleashed, and it was unleashed in a very surprising way, and it made believers out of everyone, including the American people, because of many reasons which I have discussed with you. I did not unleash that power myself, but I want here and now to pay tribute to those letter carriers who did break through the dam of repression. <laughs> and took their grievances and frustrations out into the streets for the world to see. It took golden guts to do that, and I want here and now to express admiration for those guts. Both groups, the actual strikers, the potential strikers, put enormous pressures on the representatives of management at the bargaining table. If there had not been such pressure, there wouldn't have been any bargaining table at all, and any negotiation that would have been attempted would have been a failure. So I congratulate all of you who are responsible for that great event. <laughs> Despite the exotic surroundings in which we convene, we shall not forget that this is a working convention. We have an enormous job to do. There are innumerable changes which we must make in our Constitution. If we're going to exist as a union under the laws of this land, we must make decisions here which will determine the policies of the NALC for many years to come. Some management types have chosen to consider the job action of last March as a one-time thing. They have taken the attitude that the boys have had their fun and will never be troublesome again. It may be necessary in the future to disabuse them of this notion. I hope not, I sincerely hope not, but I want you to keep those pledges of support that you have sent active and in readiness. As long as I am president of the NALC, I intend to fight for decent treatment of my members. I intend to use every, mem every weapon in the entire arsenal of industrial warfare. And if we are faced with stupid, stubbornness at the bargaining table of the future, I am putting management on notice here and now that I shall not fear to employ that entire arsenal. President James H. Rademacher's address to the convention was enthusiastically received. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The business of the convention got underway with action on the resolutions presented by the Resolutions Committee. One of the lighter moments took place when a motion was made from the floor demanding that national officers remove their coats and ties and henceforth appear in more informal attire for the rest of the convention. The proposal was unanimously adopted and the officers complied. Now that's as far as we go. <laughs> Mike, number seven, please. When we're talking about a craft of United Federation of Postal Clerks, an admirable group, perhaps, 
but who are indeed on the down Expressions of the delegates to the 1970 convention were indicative of the new trade union thinking which has occurred in the ranks of the NALC, a distinctive new philosophy developed at this convention. Those opposed? No. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the recommendation of the committee. What is the AFL CIO doing for letter carriers? Mr. Meany sent a letter to. Because of the involvement of the AFL CIO in the legislative campaigns, including activities which commenced with the postal strike, the delegates expressed themselves on the leadership of the labor movement and affiliation with it. An example was the exchange of views concerning AFL CIO President George Meany. The efforts should acknowledge the need to extend the present policy of the federal government. One of the chief concerns of the NALC today is the cost of living allowance differential in various areas. A resolution calling for extensions of the cost of living allowance into those areas where statistics indicated is so needed was quickly adopted by the delegates who felt that COLA would be more appropriate than an area wage. The nay vote on this ballot will now stand to be... Generally, the vote on resolutions and constitutional amendments was by wide margin, with the chair being able to detect the ayes and nays. However, in a few instances, it was necessary for a standing vote, and even this division required a teller count, and the tabulated report the was made to the convention. Member Enactment of, of the postal reform legislation has placed all postal workers under the provisions of the Taft-Hartley and Landrum-Griffin Acts. Your approval or your questions it was therefore Senate. necessary at this convention to act upon constitutional amendments which would cause the NALC Constitution to conform to these laws and amendments involving election and voting procedures as well as establishment of other safeguards for rank-and-file members. Now the question comes on the recommendation Considerable discussion took place on proposed amendments which would affect the methods by which national officers are elected, including proxy voting and election of officers by regions. Delegates overwhelmingly approved continuation of the present system, now accompanied by new safeguards. have it. Proceed with Amendment U. The name of James H. Rademacher has been placed in nomination for the presidency of the NELC. Are there further nominations? Microphone. At microphone number three. I nominate. Nominations were made from the floor for national officers. President Rademacher and Vice President Lewis were nominated, as were other candidates for these offices. Election results were announced, and all resident national officers were overwhelmingly re-elected. And other positions were filled with a total vote cast of more than 12,000. President James H. Rademacher, Vice President J. Stanley Lewis, the newly elected officers assembled on the podium for the installation ceremonies conducted by immediate past President Jerome J. Keating and President Emeritus William C. Doherty. As each officer's name was called, he was presented with the traditional Hawaiian lei. Oh, my honor is a man. But I will faithfully observe the laws of the National Association of Letter Carriers and all of the Laws of the State and Branch Associations. President James H. Rademacher, please take your gavel. <laughs> Norman Vincent Peale said, change your thoughts and you change your world. And your president is no different than any delegate in this hall. He has changed his thoughts as you have, and we're changing our world and that's my acceptance speech to this convention. A point of personal privilege, Mr. Chairman. Proceed. Let them be presented and let the record shown that our two other... In answer to a delegate's question as to why the traditional lay was not presented to Bill Doherty, President Rademacher made this presentation. The record will so order. Well, uh, the record will so indicate, and I hope that they will be. Mic number seven, please, Mr. President. Just a moment. Uh, I'm going to present one to Brother Doherty, and I'll even kiss him for what he said about me. Keynote speaker was Assistant Secretary of Labor W.J. Ussery, Jr., who told the delegates that the public was overwhelmingly in support of them during the March postal crisis.
Montana Congressman Arnold Olson was welcomed enthusiastically by the delegates, and President Rademacher made it clear why. What this man here has done was to prevent a nationwide strike again in April because of the assurance he gave us. And not only that, but because of this man, there will be $150 million in back pay paid to the people who work in the post office department. Let's go. Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! The muscular dystrophy poster child from Hawaii thanked the delegates and the NALC president for their support of the MDA program. But after the working sessions, there were moments of relaxation and enjoyment. On two evenings, more than 6,000 delegates and their families gathered to enjoy the traditional Hawaiian luau. And the grand ball, also traditional at every convention, this time took place on the edge of the Pacific Ocean, with the delegates dancing in the informal attire of the islands. One of the highlights unique to NALC conventions is the parade. Most delegates are in costume, and their appearance in convention cities is always a welcome sight. And I have to ask this question. After five days of hard work, the convention was adjourned by President Rademacher. I hereby declare this meeting adjourned. Cena die to meet again in New Orleans, Louisiana, two years hence. Now, everybody, let's go. that even though we're in this beautiful island, Lola land here, that uh, they still uh, were determined that it was going to be a working convention. And the no delegations at any of our conventions since 1889 have ever passed so many meaningful resolutions. And most important of all, this convention has completely revised our Constitution, which uh, can now be labeled a true trade union constitution for the first time. Okay. No question about it. Well, it'll be very interesting the next two years, I'm sure. And we're going into new experiences that uh, we wouldn't even dreamed about two years ago or four years ago. Oh, I could be wrong, but I think this is the first time in my memory of 20 years coming to national conventions that we completed all of the resolutions of every committee. I can't recall doing that before and going through the whole book. Yes, they, they acted upon every resolution, and I might say, if you hadn't counted them lately, there were over 600 resolutions addressed to this convention in one way or another or before one committee or another, plus over 110 amendments. So they had to be a working convention or we never would have gotten done. That's great. The National Association of Letter Carriers uh, is uh, definitely now uh, in the same ballpark with the big league other unions. And uh, they have gotten there by themselves through the actions that they have taken and not only through the concerted action that was taken during the spring, but the action here. And the action taken here was even greater than the action that was taken last spring because it has solidified us. And as we now go to that bargaining table where we have now uh, become true negotiators rather than lobbyists, we need that kind of support that was displayed here. 
and it is, it's very wholesome, and it's going to be extremely helpful to the officers of the NALC to have that kind of backup support so that management at that bargaining table knows that every one of our more than 200,000 members stands solidly behind the negotiators for the NALC. That's the way they want it, and that's the way we want it, and that's the way it's going to be.